treasure chest of natural resources, oil, minerals and marine life, the sea has always been vital for India, for her economy, her commerce, her very existence. It has formed a natural highway between India and the rest of the world. In the past, the same highway was used by foreign invaders to conquer India and exploit her for over 200 years. Recently, it witnessed a reversal of roles of sorts. The Indian Navy ships raced over the waves to restore peace and tranquility in the Maldives, a friendly neighbor threatened by marauders. Today, India has much at stake. A rich maritime inheritance along a 7,000 kilometer coastline and an enormous exclusive economic zone. An ever increasing threat in and around her waters has forced India to develop a strong modern navy with a large indigenous component. nineteen forty seven an independent India at last the British left her a paltry naval legacy four anti-aircraft frigates two anti-submarine frigates and twelve minesweepers there were no submarines and no aircraft carriers Today, the Indian Navy boasts of two aircraft carriers, one nuclear-powered submarine, 14 conventional submarines, and an equally impressive number of state-of-the-art frigates, making it the eighth largest navy in the world. When did this modernization and indigenization of the Indian Navy begin? At the time of our independence, we had only about uh, eight old ships. And by 1961, we had acquired two cruisers, eight brand new frigates, and of course, our first aircraft carrier, the Vikrant. But at the same time, we realized that if we wanted to be a very strong and a self-sufficient Navy, we could not rely on imports forever and ever, and we would have to make a, st make a start in developing and building ships indigenously. But the real impetus to indigenous construction was given when we acquired the erstwhile British-owned Mazgon Docks Limited in 1962. 
soon after that we entered into a collaboration agreement with two british shipyards for the acquisition of the design and for the construction of the leander class frigates in india in mazgaon dock on 26th january 1950 The new republic dropped the prefix royal from the Royal Indian Navy and the service became the Indian Navy. The Indian Navy continued to be headed by a British officer for 8 more years. till 22nd april 1958 when vice admiral r d katari became the first indian chief of naval staff making it a truly indian service even as the navy was acquiring an indian character a second dimension was given to her a naval air arm ins garuda came up at cochin and the fleet requirement unit was raised with a squadron of sealand aircrafts of world war 2 vintage the future of the naval air arm was further secured with the commissioning of the former british aircraft carrier hms hercules as ins vikrant into the indian navy on the 4th of march 1961 1965 Indo-Pak war highlighted the absence of the crucial third dimension of the Indian Navy the submarine arm forays by Pakistani ships into Indian waters were effectively deflected by surface ships The greatest challenge was posed by Pakistan submarine PNS Ghazi. She is known to have closed in to 12 miles off the Bombay harbor. In 1965, India and the USSR signed a package deal for the purchase of a Foxtrot class submarine squadron, training of personnel in the Soviet Union, and technical assistance in setting up training and shore facilities at Vishakhapatnam. India's first submarine, INS Kalvari, was commissioned on 20th December 1969 to give the Indian Navy a truly three-dimensional character. same time it was decided to build a general purpose frigate at the mazagon docks bombay 
While shopping for a design, the Indian Navy opted for the British Leanders, the latest in the market then, thus making India's first indigenous effort a major modernization attempt as well. INS Nilgiri, the first of the six Leanders, was launched on 23rd October 1968. It took almost four years to build. By July 1981, the Leander program underwent a sea change. So much so that the last two Leanders, each capable of carrying a Sea King helicopter on board, were a quantum jump ahead of the first Leander. did we select a Leander design instead of creating an Indian one? We took on the Leander design mainly because we neither had a big enough or competent enough design organization. Our shipbreeding yards were not geared up to constructing sophisticated warships and of course we did not have the infrastructure. So we uh, decided first of all to import the design, try and build one or two ships on that design, and then A, try and improve on the design itself, and then to see if we can substitute the imported equipment machinery with indigenous one. And we have achieved uh, notable successes in all the areas. Even as the Leander program was gathering momentum, the 1971 war broke out. The Indian Navy tasted its first blood when it sank PNS Ghazi, the Pakistani submarine, off Vishakhapatnam on the night of 3rd December and followed it up with an attack on the Karachi harbour the next day. Successful and devastating was this attack by her OSA-class missiles and a large task force that ever since then, the day, 4th December, is observed as Navy Day. The 1971 war also saw the Indian Navy suffer her first loss. INS Kukri was sunk by a Pakistani submarine. The same war also saw the first shadow of superpower intervention in the region, with the US 7th Fleet entering the Bay of Bengal. The fleet was headed by USS Enterprise, a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. What crucial lessons did we learn from these two wars? The 65 war basically brought to our notice certain deficiencies we had in the Indian fleet. For instance, as far as submarines were concerned, we were behind Pakistan who had acquired submarines before us and 65 we did not have any submarines. Even in the surface fleet we found that 
as a consequence of the 1962 Chinese incident. Priority had been given to the Army and the Air Force quite rightly, but this had resulted in the Indian fleet remaining at a status quo and the uh, Pakistani fleet had caught up with us by that time. By the time 1971 came, most of these deficiencies had been set right. We had by that time acquired four submarines, we had acquired oh. missile boats and our surface fleet also was quite strong. To my mind, Indian Navy had primarily three achievements to its credit in 1971. First and the most important and the most widely known is of course our offensive action that we took with our surface vessels on Karachi Harbour. The second which is not so widely known is the success of the Indian Navy in keeping open Indian ports throughout the 14-day war, which was, I think, a major achievement. And the third one was to ensure the safety of our merchant marine and trade throughout the war. As far as the first is concerned, it brought home a lesson that offense, in fact, is the best form of defense. And fortune always favors the bold. No side ever won a hockey match by having all its 11 players around its goal. And hence, it has been underlined by that one action the requirement for a Navy which can reach out into the sea and carry the action to the enemy. It is, actual, it is just as important for us to ensure in future that our harbors remain open at all times because they are really our lifeline and so are our merchant ships. So therefore in any future conflict we will have to ensure that our merchant marine which has now grown to nearly 7 million tons and has nearly 800 ships remains unmolested and is able to bring and to carry goods away from India throughout the operations. In 1973, while oil prices skyrocketed the world over, significant events were taking place which were to further shape India's policy of indigenization and modernization of her Navy. India's Sagar Samrat, the ONGC rig, struck oil in Bombay High off the Bombay coast in the Arabian Sea. Soon this area was to become the oil bowl of the country. Simultaneously, the United Nations, at its third Law of the Seas conference, created exclusive economic zones, adding to territorial responsibilities. Only 10 years ago, we were getting about a million tons of oil per year from Bombay High. That figure has now surpassed 20 million tons and there are at present over 60 platforms of various sizes and shapes about 120 to 140 kilometers away from our coast. 
the responsibility for protecting these both in peace and war has devolved on the Indian Navy. Secondly, as you know, in 1978, India, by a presidential proclamation, claimed an exclusive economic zone about 200 kilometers from its coastline. This meant that an area roughly equal to about 2 million square kilometers has been claimed by us as an exclusive economic zone for exploiting its resources, whether they are fisheries, seabed resources, oil, etc., exclusively for our own use. Again, the protection of these is a responsibility of the Indian Navy. Thus arose the need for more sophisticated, large and indigenous warships like the Godavari class frigates, India's first indigenously designed and constructed frigates. One of the lessons of the 1971 war was, it was for the second time only that surface to surface missiles were used in a war. And in a way it transformed naval warfare at sea. In those days we had only small missile boats which didn't have much endurance which carried missiles. We realized that to be effective, we must have platforms which will be able to keep at sea for a long period and carry missiles. And hence, the evolution of the original Leander class frigate into what we now call the Godavari class frigate. It is a ship which is basically on the Leander hull but modified and stretched by us, but with a totally different uh, weapon package. The 125 meter long Godavari frigate is basically a stretched and broad beamed offshoot of the Leanders. It is the only ship of its size in the world which can carry two large seeking helicopters on board equipped with Soviet missiles, Italian anti-submarine torpedoes, guns and radars also from the Soviet Union, and Indian and Dutch command control systems, the Godavari is probably the most international ship in the world. This international character also posed serious problems of intricate interfacing between the different systems, didn't it? How were they overcome? It is not very easy when we have equipment from the West and the East and a number of countries to match them and to interface them. We have had to set up special teams and they have done a commendable job in ensuring that all the weapon systems, the radars, the computers, the electronics are all matched and interfaced. And we have successfully carried this exercise out. With this experience behind us, we see no problem in future construction in being able to interface diverse equipment. The first Godavari class frigate launched on 15th May 1983, was commissioned as INS Godavari on 10th December the same year. The ensuing period, however, saw a rapid deterioration of the environment in the Indian Ocean. 
acquisition of new bases by superpowers, frequent movement of foreign warships in the area, and rapid modernization of naval fleets of our neighbors, which included the acquisition of harpoon missiles and other destructive weapons. Also, in 1987, the United Nations Law of the Seas Conference accorded India the pioneer status in deep seabed mining. An area of 1,50,000 square kilometers was allotted to her in the Indian Ocean for the purpose. To safeguard our interests, the Indian Navy began augmenting her submarine branch. It inducted two German-made Type 1500 Hunter Killer submarines, said to be the most sophisticated in the world. Two more are being built at the Mazagon Docks, Bombay, and will be followed by indigenously designed submarines. Another addition was the Kilo-class submarines with their unique teardrop hull. These were acquired from the Soviet Union in readiness for phasing out the earlier Foxtrot class submarines. But the country's most significant acquisition in this field was that of INS Chakra, a nuclear powered submarine also from the USSR. The surface fleet was further modernized with the induction of Soviet-built Kashin-class destroyers, the Durgs, and the Veer-class of missile boats. was also brought up to date with the addition of V-stall aircrafts, the Sea Harriers. They replaced the old Seahawks by 1983. The induction of HMS Hermes as INS Virat into the Indian Navy on 12th May 1987 further strengthened the naval air arm. Shortly before this, the old reliable INS Vikant, India's first aircraft carrier, went in for a major refit and modernization at the Navy's own dockyard in Bombay. Over the years, this dockyard has equipped itself to carry out elaborate refits and repairs as it is doing now on the Vikrant. Along with Sea Harriers, sophisticated anti-submarine warfare helicopters, the Sea Kings of British make, and Kamovs made in the Soviet Union were also inducted. But a quantum jump in anti-submarine warfare capability came with the acquisition of Tu-142, the long-range Soviet maritime aircraft known in the NATO as the Bear. This new state-of-the-art equipment needed equally well-trained officers and men, hence such sophisticated simulators. What we are trying to achieve at present is to try and improve the indigenous content in the ships that we are building in India. 
when we started in 1964 and the sh first ship was completed in 1972 i think the indigenous content was about 50 to 60 percent we are now somewhere in the area of 85 percent indigenous con content in the ships that we are constructing and we hope to take it up in future ships to about 95 percent leaving only a small amount of equipment which will have to be imported. The turn of the century should well see the country acquire enough expertise to modernize indigenously and create a sophisticated and modern navy within its own dockyards. Yeah.